Thanks for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to discuss European immigration affairs with you. I'm not going to be historical now, but I'm happy to answer questions on 20th century history, preferably, and try to do my best on them. Um, Europe nowadays presents a contradictory picture with regard to immigration and ethnic plurality. If we consider developments in the past decade, we can see on the one hand a new openness to immigration, albeit selective, following a record high of migratory movements in the 1990s, but also a tightening of European borders with refugees drowning in the Mediterranean. We have further witnessed the emergence of a new, more activist approach to integration motivated by, to put it positively, a new awareness of the continuing inequalities, the unequal life chances of those who came as immigrants since the 1950s or are the children of immigrants. And I'm going to use the term immigrants widely. It's, it's not, well, it doesn't mean the same in every European country. So you can refer to second generation children of immigrants as immigrants, I think, so it's not meant in a derogatory way. The awareness of continuing inequalities, however, often takes the form of accusations against the immigrants themselves, um, who are blamed for their alleged unwillingness to adjust and to make sufficient efforts. The unsatisfactory state of integration is often seen as a cultural problem, one of adjustment and loyalty. And following that, a backlash against policies of cultural plurality has occurred, justified by fears of dangerous splits in European societies and, of course, linked with fears of the effects of a worldwide confrontation between a Muslim and a Western world. In the following half hour, I shall first briefly illustrate the critique of past policies, basically give you a few quotes on that and the problem perceptions predominant at the moment. Uh, second, I shall discuss the evidence with regard to some dimensions of the alleged separation of immigrant or ethnic minorities and mainstream society. Before, I third want to look more pointedly at whether multiculturalism should be blamed for some of the existing problems or indeed achievements. What I'm going to say about Europe mainly refers to the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and Germany. It is sometimes also true for countries like France or Denmark to a lesser extent, I think, for southern European countries and for East European countries, but we could maybe refer to them in the discussion. I don't think that you could really justify to talk about all European countries as well representing one uniform trend. So obviously I'm going to generalize, although in fact I believe that the background to policy changes and the meanings of a discourse that seems to be similar um, throughout several European countries that the meanings and backgrounds may be nationally different. But again, this could be an issue for our discussion. Now, common problem perceptions, the critique of past policies. Let me just selectively illustrate this by giving you a couple of quotes. In the United Kingdom, Trevor Phillips, then head of the Commission of Racial Equality, which has now been merged into a grand human rights commission, caused an uproar when in 2005 he diagnosed Britain as sleepwalking our way to segregation, as you can see here. Am I actually standing in the way? I'm not quite sure where to stand so that people can <laughs> see everything. Um, he has repeated similar statements more recently. About a year ago, for instance, he said that we've seen the emergence of a kind of cold war in some parts of the country where separate communities exist side 
by side increasing the likelihood of little interaction and with poor communication, etc. He called for some more fundamental agreement on common values. There's another one here, even more pointed, a newspaper article right after the July 2005 bombings, the bombings in London, the tube and bus bombings, where you see the allegedly mistaken policy of multiculturalism is being blamed for a lack of integration, a culturally and morally unassimilated immigrant demi-intelligentsia. He doesn't like the intelligentsia as well. In the Netherlands in 2000, note the date, this begins before 9-11, this debate. Yeah, in 2000, a much debated article entitled The Multicultural Drama attacked a failure of integration and of multiculturalism, which author Paul Schaeffer describes as a philosophy of living side by side but not with each other. A recent parliamentary document there states that, quote, with the cultivation of one's own cultural identity, obviously a key element of multiculturalism, um, it's not possible to bridge differences which such cultivation of cultural identities. There's another German quote. This is a conservative Christian Democratic Party in their 2005 election manifesto. They think that ghettos have been formed and parallel societies are in existence representing alarming signals for social peace in the country. And social democratic former Chancellor Schröder um, seems to agree on essential points. He said plurality, okay, but no culture can be allowed to separate itself from the overall structures of society. Now you can see that there are a number of common features in these quotes. The problem that supposedly needs to be addressed is a cultural one, one of um, social interaction rooted in cultural problems sometimes and the lack or weakness of common values. Second, often the immigrants are attacked for an alleged withdrawal into separate communities. This is the cultures that separate themselves from the overall societies. The term parallel societies has been, become common parlance in Europe and separateness is at the same time defined as unacceptable. And third, multiculturalism is described as a policy encouraging or even celebrating such separation. Additionally, it's often alleged that for too long a culture of silence or the predominance of an intelligentsia that doesn't want to, uh, to face the problems. We know these common accusations against people like us that this has prevented us from addressing the problems. Now all this is not only a discourse but the justification of sub substantial policy changes. I will not go into the details of the policy changes today, but only point at the typical features, a greater emphasis on the dominant language uh, accompanied by pressure to acquire the language of the host country. Partly language competences have been made a requirement for family migration and residence. New measures to further the cultural and identificational integration have been introduced, like civic integration courses, tests as a precondition of naturalization. Components of multiculturalism, like mother tongue teaching and support for minority organizations, have come under pressure. Generally, immigration and residence requirements have been tightened. More expulsions um, occur, less generous admission of partners and other family members are typical in several European countries. And of course, refugees have a hard time to enter any European country and to be allowed to stay there. Still, on balance, it is an issue for debate to what extent the departure from multiculturalism is mainly rhetorical or has led to substantive policy transformation and what impact rhetoric, symbolic policies 
may have if this is the main peach, uh, feature. Sorry, and Phillips in her new book on multiculturalism, for instance, refers to, quote, a sharp retreat from the rhetoric of multiculturalism in Europe. I want to leave that question open for the time being and first discuss whether the problem analysis just sketch, sketched out has any substance. I want to look at segregation, the question of uh, separate lives or parallel societies and inter-ethnic social interaction. Now, separate lives, to what extent is this reality in Europe? Here, can I rely on my own empirical research on segregation patterns in Germany in particular, but we also put this in a more comparative perspective. Such research is actually um, mostly lacking in Europe, sound empirical research on segregation patterns in a comparative light. Now, the, um, I give you the, the brief um, message first. Um, it's a common feature that immigrants and members of ethnic minorities are more likely to live in poor neighborhoods. That's not a surprise in an environment marked by multiple deprivation and in substandard housing. Nevertheless, the image of ghettos or even secluded immigrant neighborhoods and communities in European cities is deeply misleading. In Germany in particular, the residential concentration of immigrants and ethnic minorities is very low. In the Netherlands and Britain, it's higher. But there as well, the situation is not comparable to the situation of African Americans in the United States. Living in deprived neighborhoods does not mean living in completely segregated neighborhoods. Now, a few more details on that. This is for Germany. Immigrants are generally a more urban population in Europe than non-immigrant residents. However, in Germany in particular, they live fairly widely distributed over the country with the exception of the former East Germany. Thus, the largest Turkish community, the one in Berlin, represents only 7% of Germany's Turkish population. This is the largest um, group in any one German city. This is a bit different in other countries. This in Britain, London is the home of about 40% of the ethnic minority population, 40 as compared with only 7% percent of the Turkish population in Berlin. There's no single German city where one foreign nationality accounts for more than 10 percent of the population. Duisburg is actually the one with the highest share of a Turkish immigrant group, not Berlin. Again, this would be slightly different in Britain. When you apply international standards, you would be hard pressed to find any ethnic neighborhood in a German city. International standards often use a 30 or 40 percent threshold. I mean, this is not a clearly defined thing in ethnic, ethnic neighborhood. There's common usage, but it's not clearly defined. But people use 30 or 40 percent for the USA and Canada. Now, we did a study with a sample of 1,810 neighborhoods, spatial areas in Germany. And um, the highest population share of one national group we found was 38%. But this was extremely exceptional. And we could only find 15 spatial units, 15 in 1,810, where the share of one national group, usually but not always the Turks, reached 20% or more. 20, yeah, not 30 or 40. So rather than ethnic neighborhoods, German cities contain ethnically mixed immigrant neighborhoods. But even then, the German nationals are usually in the majority. Larger districts with more than 50% foreign nationals exist, but they are rare. In Frankfurt, for instance, which has something like 28%, I think, foreign nationals altogether, 
of 45 urban districts um, in 2004, only one had a majority of non-German nationals. So the typical feature is distribution over the city, concentration in immigrant neighborhoods. Concentrations are higher in Britain, but even here there's a huge gap in comparison with the United States. Oxford geographer Kerry Peach has compared Chicago in particular with some cities in Britain, and I quote his findings. He says that in 2000, over half of Chicago's black population lived in tracts where they formed 95% or more of the population, over half of the black population in tracts where they formed 95% or more of the population. Now in England and Wales, only 9% of the combined minority population lived in wards where they constituted 67 or more percent of the population. He uses this 67 because some people have developed this threshold of 66 and 80 percent of shares for single minorities in order to define ethnic enclaves or ghettos. So according to that, in England and Wales, 9 percent of the ethnic minority population, but only if you take them together as one group, would live in ethnic enclaves or Ghettos. So even in the UK, where concentration is much higher than in Germany, you would be hard-pressed to find ghettos. You do find ethnic neighborhoods, but still only a minority. Well, in London, something like a fifth, for instance, of the ethnic minority population live in ethnic neighborhoods. I have more details here, but I will skip them for now. So if residential segregation or mixing is regarded as a main basis for inter-ethnic contact, then we should say that conditions are not all that bad in Europe for interaction and we don't see spatial segregation as being a predominant feature. Still, is the existing separateness a result of choice, only a few hints here because research is not very good on that. Um, there is, um, in a survey done in Germany, you find hints that migrants of Turkish origin to a greater extent than, for instance, Italian immigrants, remember the guest workers were often Italians or Spanish or Greeks in Germany, um, uh, they, in their choice of accommodation, take the ethnic milieu of an area into account. In a survey, a quarter of Turks said they preferred to live in an area mainly inhabited by foreigners. This a question was put in a slightly stupid way. They asked about foreigners, not about co-ethnics. Only 9.5% of Italians and about 12% of former Yugoslavs and of Greeks shared this preference, but note that it's a minority for all groups. Over 60% throughout said they did not care or they preferred to live in mixed areas. For Britain, there's a study on, on Bradford, a major Asian populated city, showing that concentrations are a result of population growth mainly, increasing Asian populations are population growth rather than preference of people to live together and that minority populations tend to move out of segregated areas. So all this idea of an increasing withdrawal of immigrants into well, segregated areas or segregated lives is not backed up by the evidence here. Of course, life in poverty areas is another problem. I will not discuss this here now, but just, well, mention that this is another point we should take seriously. And the schools are, again, a separate problem where segregation is much higher than in the residential areas. But uh, again, I only mention this at the moment. So what about actual contact? If residential structures are the precondition for contact, what, to what extent does it happen? Now again, the brief message first is contact does take place.
for most migrants or ethnic minority members. It is not decreasing as far as we can tell. Again, here we don't see a, tr a trend towards withdrawal. Immigrants often want more contact with members of the minority population, which should remind us that contact requires two sides to want such inter-ethnic interaction. We should not only look at the immigrants when we talk about inter-ethnic contact. Now, this is probably a bit difficult to see. I just show you um, survey evidence for three countries. Now, this is the UK. Um, you can see if you only look at figures here, this is do you have contact with people from different ethnic groups socially outside work. You can see that a large majority of black and Asian respondents were 59% here for the Asians say they do. The smallest percentage is always among the majority population. They, of course, the least likely were partly due to numbers, but then we could discuss whether this has to do with their general openness towards such contact. So you see that contact outside of work relations does happen for my majority. This is the Netherlands where um, I only had different figures. There's a problem with European comparisons that, of course, you never get uniform data. Survey evidence in particular, they ask questions differently. So here, this is more narrowly. They ask people whether their contacts are predominantly within their own group. They could still have contacts with other groups that predominantly. And actually, this looks like less contact here. In the Netherlands, if you look at the Turks, this is here done by residential concentration. Even if they live in extremely mixed neighborhoods where there are few other Turks, 52% say that their contacts are pre predominantly within their own groups. Much lower here for the Surinamese and the Antillians. These are the four major non-Western immigrant groups. These are the groups the Dutch mostly look at. Um, this is Germany. Um, well, this is in German, but I briefly explained. This is for Turks only. The spheres in which they have contacts with German uh, Germans, you can see that this is fairly high. I mean, we're in the 70-80% range. This is in the neighborhood. This is among friends and acquaintances. It's going down for at work because they're increasingly unemployed. Yeah, but this year is astonishingly high. This is in the family. I actually can't really trust this, how more than 30% say they have contacts with Germans in their family because the intermarriage rates are not quite that high. But this is what you get in surveys. Often you don't understand how people arrive at their answers. But, well, I've, it's, yeah, you can do with these results. Well, you can interpret them on your own, so always, well, uh, is this a high level or is this a low level of interethnic contact? That's difficult to tell. Um, but before, maybe I, I take a step back and look at those who have little contact, because they should be the, the problem group or the group that may withdraw or be little connected with the majority contacts. In this survey um, of Turks, well, Turks is here, not a nationality category. It includes nationalized German Turks, um, ethnic Turks. Um, the results showed that leisure time contacts, which is contacts that are likely to be deliberate, not just, well, created through work conditions or whatever, are rare for about 35%, which is a significant share. And looking at those with little contact, to split this up a bit more, um, they found that privately 16% meet Germans only a couple of times per year and 19% next to never. 9% report no contact with Germans at all, 9%. But in, well, qualifying this, we, we should um, know that these people tend to be older, they tend to be first generation guest workers or family members, they tend to be lesser 
educated, they're often not employed. So language, employment and age are surely factors that determine whether people will have their contacts mainly in the family and the narrow ethnic groups or more broadly. Okay, I already said it's a matter of interpretation, whether you think there's a lot of inter-ethnic contact or contact is limited. I think one shouldn't be too euphoric. I mean, this is not a picture that shows everyone is mixing. There is a certain degree of separateness more pronounced for the South Asian minorities in Britain and for the Turkish and Moroccan populations in the Netherlands and Germany. But on the other hand, most members of minority groups interact regularly and in their leisure time with members of the ethnic majority and important for the general debate about changing trends. We can't see a trend towards reduced contact. This is not visible in the empirical evidence. Although, on the other hand, among a certain share of immigrants, which is difficult to quantify, there may be a desire to live among co-ethnics and separate from mainstream society. I have a couple of empirical facts here. Maybe I'll leave this for the time being. You could guess that this may be among Turks in Germany, 15% who say we wish to live among co-ethnics. Again, a question for a discussion maybe, is this all right? You're a perfect individual right in a democratic liberal society or does this constitute a problem for society overall? I also have a few facts and figures on intermarriage, but I think I will not go into this is intermarriage rates in Germany, only showing the trend that it's going up quite significantly, written for different groups, not quite as clear. Maybe if someone is specifically interested, we could look at this in the discussion. Now, altogether, um, I think there's little reason to imagine immigrants and ethnic minorities in Europe as predominantly leading separate lives or living in parallel society. There are many dimensions of integration and interaction between minorities and majority populations. Um, to the extent that separation exists in some spheres of life, it's not necessarily a consequence of choice on the part of the minorities. We'd have to look at the different determinants of well, housing or social interaction. Although there are probably parts of the minorities, minorities within the minorities, I should say, you prefer to live among themselves. I've already said maybe about 15% of the Turkish origin population in Germany. It's a controversial issue whether this is all right or whether it is a problem for a democratic and liberal society. I think it is a problem if this separateness means that groups are excluded from access to core resources, if a conflict potential develops because people feel unable to communicate their needs and to take part in key decisions affecting their lives, and of course if anti-democratic movements develop in such contexts. As regards the latter, uh, we don't have any conclusive evidence linking residential segregation or even um, social separateness with loyalty. All the evidence we have, although it may not be satisfactory, shows um, that generally loyalty or identification with British German society altogether support for core democratic values is quite high among minority populations. In some German surveys, I always show this to, well, some audiences that it's often higher among Turkish Germans than among East Germans who are far more reserved towards democracy. 
And uh, definitely it's not linked with living in um, a segregated environment. Yeah, so hardly a systematic link between residential social segregation and loyalty with society overall. Okay, but at this point there's of course a huge amount of material for discussion here about social cohesion, what holds a society together and what amount of uh, separateness can a society tolerate. Maybe I, that's too much to go into all this. Now let me state at this point only that to the extent that they focus on, as, on an assumed mass phenomenon of immigrant withdrawal and alleged unwillingness of the immigrant population to integrate and to interact with the majority population, the current European debates are misguided and they direct the attention away from more serious problems of unemployment or employment chances and educational opportunities immigrant populations still don't have to the same extent as other groups of the population. I have some details on such inequalities here but again I skip this at the moment. Now having said this that the focus on culture directs attention away from the actual more well old-fashioned social problems of integration. I have to concede that in the critique of multiculturalism actually a link is being established between life chances and the maintenance of cultural or ethnic peculiarities. So let me come back to the direct critique of multicultural policies and to the question of what effects these policies may have had. Um, take the critique of Dutch policies. Now the, the Dutch are the most severely criticized having been well, for many Europeans the model of a multicultural solution to the problems arising from immigration critique of Dutch policies. There's a great dissatisfaction with the extent of unemployment in the Netherlands. I think I have some data here. I mean, this, they do this Western and un, not Western. Um, the, the bluish here is the employed population. The red is unemployed. This is the rest. Yeah, broadly, you see the difference here. This is the long-term Dutch population. This here is the non-Western immigrant population. So you see there's a clear difference. In 2007, unemployment among the native Dutch stood at 3.8 percent, while among the so-called non-Western immigrants, more than 10 percent were unemployed. That's more than 2.5 times greater share of the group, um, 3.8 to 10.1 percent. Now Germany with its tougher and more assimilationist policies, sometimes compared favorably with the Netherlands. Their unemployment among immigrants is only about twice as high as among the rest of the population. Some scholars like Ruth Koopmans point out they often do not mention that this is a difference on a higher level. In Germany, then unemployment would be 20% among immigrants, not 10, just that it's twice instead of 2.5 or three times as much. Um, clearly both countries have failed to ensure equal, equal employment opportunities, of course, for immigrants and their descendants. Now is Dutch multiculturalism to be blamed for a greater gap between immigrants and natives? Often it's not specified how a policy of multiculturalism could potentially affect employment chances. I mean, think it through for yourselves. How could the link work? It could just theoretically. If you assume that such a policy prevents or discourages immigrants from adopting the norms and values, the standards of behavior and the linguistic competencies necessary for employment, as well as establishing the social networks helping you into jobs or better jobs. 
And if you assume that unemployment or insecure employment, worse employment, is caused by such deficits on the part of the immigrants and not by other economic factors, which surely also play a part, you could then still argue, or I would still argue, that this only shows that multiculturalism has to be accompanied by a policy aiming to change institutions that allow such discrimination between people who hold different values and norms, for instance, or people who have the better social networks bringing them into jobs. Um, but still, let it be. There is a recent empirical study that tries to get some more substance into this comparison of Germany and the Netherlands done by Dagevoss and others, a Dutch research institution, and um, on the employment position of Turks in particular. As usual, they don't come up with a simple answer. They actually say it's not true that the Netherlands perform um, badly in all respects. They say that looking at the employment situation overall, there are points where the Netherlands do better than Germany. Second, they say one major reason for a different performance is the fact that the composition of the group differs. In the Netherlands, the Turkish immigration is more recent, it's more rural than to Germany, so the educational background would be less favorable, and this explains a lot of the employment, of the bad employment situation. Third, they do concede that integration policy may have had an effect on language competencies. They're worse in the Netherlands, according to survey. Possibly this could be related to little pressure on immigrants to acquire the Dutch language, little support granted to them. Although I don't find this entirely plausible when I look at Germany, where the situation was not that different. I mean, there wasn't wide-ranging support for immigrants to acquire the German language, so I can't quite see why here policies should be the crucial factor behind differences. So the study concludes altogether that there's no clear proof for either position, for the critique of multiculturalism or for the defense of multiculturalism. It may, be, um, it may well be that policies altogether had little effect. Again, this is a major research issue, I think. How much do policies actually affect immigrant opportunities as well as maybe in social policy impacts more generally. I mean, how much impact do social policy interventions have on the actual life chances of people or how much more influence does the economic situation, the family background, etc. have? So we may be focusing entirely on the wrong area here by struggling or fighting about multiculturalism. Yes and uh, no. Well, the, the authors of this study, they also say, well, they see no positive effect of Dutch integration policies on labor market opportunities of immigrants, which is a devastating finding. And clearly, Dutch immigrant policies had major deficits and, I should say, a failure to combine multiculturalism with effective equal opportunities policies rather than an all-out um, failure of multiculturalism. Generally, I believe that in research we should begin to treat multiculturalism not as a clearly defined and uniform concept, which it wasn't and it isn't. If you look at what Canada does, what Britain does, what Germans do who talk about multiculturalism, and that we should look more specifically at what the rhetoric, and it's more rhetoric or a general commitment to pluralism, what it actually meant or today means in different political cultures and how it was implemented and then look more precisely at what impact such different policies may have had rather than looking for this very general overall statement. Am I taking too much time?
What we'll do is uh, go on for a few more minutes, just break slightly so that colleagues that need to be at something at one to leave, and then we'll, we'll have to Okay, start. well, I, I will conclude definitely before one. Now, this was employment, unemployment, and the linkage with multiculturalism. I just want to look at one other example. Um, there's a recent book that compares the United States and Canada, um, written by Irene Blomrath. She's now in Los Angeles, I think. She claims that due to its policy of multiculturalism, Canada has a better record than the United States with regard to naturalizations and political participation. And she thinks that this is because, I quote, government policies can facilitate incorporation by providing immigrant communities with material resources to engage in political mobilization, by increasing access to political decision makers, and by shaping understandings of immigrant symbolic place within the Polity. So Canadian multiculturalism here has a positive influence compared with U.S. non-intervention. I don't think that she actually manages to prove her argument, but I find this way of linking government policies and political representation and identification plausible, maybe more plausible than the link between multiculturalism and the employment situation. In fact, the Netherlands, like Canada, are doing comparatively well with regard to political representation and participation, which is not that often mentioned when the Dutch are bashed for their unemployment rates and bad educational performance. In 2006, just a few more facts and figures, 17 out of 150 seats in the national Parliament, so more than 10% were held by politicians of non-Western origin, um, which is more than in Britain, and actually um, as distinct from Britain, where the minority politicians are mostly with the Labour Party, in the Netherlands they represent the full range of political parties. Now you could argue that this is related to the granting of voting rights on the local level to foreigners as part of the multicultural policy of the 1980s. Following that, the number of councillors of minority background increased steeply from only 74 in 1949 to 150 four years later and then to a bit more than 300 in 2006. So within 12 years, um, that's more than 1994 to 2006, yes, 12 years from 74 to 302. I find this quite impressive and as I said, maybe um, this had an impact on the national level um, as well and in some of the big cities the migrant population is today proportionally represented in the political decision-making bodies. Also, public opinion is still very supportive of immigrant political participation. I think I have the figures for that. This is a question from a very recent survey. So you see that in the Netherlands, 76% support voting rights um, for immigrants in local municipal elections, uh, no criticism it seems, or no significant criticism of this policy here. You could argue that multicultural policies have led to a relatively high acceptance of plurality among the population. If you compare different countries, this is your barometer, unfortunately a bit older figures, but this general multicultural statement, it's a good thing for any society to be made up of people from different races, religions, or cultures. You can see that in the multicultural countries, Britain and the Netherlands, support for this position is significantly higher than in Germany. You can also see that, well, no, the European average is not here. I have all the details for different European countries, but I spare you those now. But altogether, you have a slight majority throughout Europe actually supporting pluralism. So we shouldn't imagine 
Europe altogether as tightening and as complete, being completely immigrant and favoring assimilation and homogeneity. This would be a wrong picture. Um, yeah, I just said I have a few more current um, survey results that show that these, the support for multiculturalism does go down in the past few years, but it's not a breakdown of support for multiculturalism. I mean, this would be Britain 2005. You see August, which is after the bomb attacks in London, and you still see that the national response is the gray. Um, about a third of the population say multiculturalism threatens a British way of life. This is a significant part of the population right after the, bo the bombings, but it's one third. It's not the majority supports multiculturalism, making Britain a better place of life. So, um, yeah, you could argue that here we have some positive effects of multiculturalism, more political participation, better political inclusion of immigrants, and higher support, actually, for policies of plurality. So let me conclude. Um, there's a renewed debate about immigrant integration in Europe, to, which is to a significant extent dominated by the critique of pluralist approaches of multiculturalism. The is assumed problems this debate and the policy shift legitimized through it respond to do not exist as mass phenomena. The most pressing integration problems are not the withdrawal of immigrant communities from mainstream society, but the old and well-known problems of education and labor market integration with difference between differences between European countries in that expect. Now, to some extent, this is acknowledged in the integration debate. I don't want to misrepresent it. There's not only a debate about culture and linguistic adjustment. The political debate does address education and labor market integration, but the emphasis on cultural problems, alleged parallel societies, etc., gives the debate a wrong twist and directs attention away from the major problems. It may further alienate the minority population, an effect well, not very often thought about, and it serves to legitimize restrictionist immigrant policies that do, to a considerable extent, accompany the new integration policies. Now, the reasons why such a misbalanced integration debate takes place could be the subject of a separate analysis, so more research questions here. And again, I only mention this research issue without going into it now. In future, I think, um, multiculturalism will hardly be advocated openly in most European countries, although in fact some elements seem to survive in combination with tougher and also more activist integration policies that immigrant organizations have recently been discovered as indispensable partners of integration. Policy. So to some extent, policy change here may indeed be a change of rhetorics, but I do think we should take rhetorics seriously as they do have an effect, symbolic policies affect, for instance, um, participation, they affect the general climate in a society, and they affect the well-being of immigrants, surely, apart from, well, as I said, legitimizing maybe restrictionist immigration policies, so we shouldn't say it's only rhetorics, we, we should take them seriously as well, although altogether European countries have not thrown out multicultural policies, altogether they sometimes continue in hiding or under different names in an altogether more, well, assimilationist, yeah, maybe it's a bit too strong, but I say maybe a more assimilationist climate. And I'll stop there.
Well, it depends. On, I mean, this year, is, I depend on the question they ask in this, this BBC survey. Well, I mean, here I'm interested in what people mean when they are asked about multiculturalism. Sure yeah. Especially because, no, no, this question seems particularly important. Uh, multiculturalism was getting quietly defined there, and I, I'd like to make sure that everybody uh, gets Karen's reaction. So, so now, now the floor is open, and, and maybe we can start with Laura's question. Thank yeah. You. What are yeah? So what are we talking about when when I refer to opinions on multiculturalism? Well, actually, I think probably you can't properly define multiculturalism. I mean, attempts have been made. There, there is a volume by Benting and Kimlicka, and and they think they have two or three weak and strong multiculturalism, and they have a couple of criteria they have for strong multiculturalism is clear government support, it is, um, I think, mother tongue teaching, it is immigrant representation on particular bodies like TV stations and various important public institutions, support for immigrant organizations, etc. They have a list of eight or ten criteria for that. And, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what country would fully meet them. Um, Britain, for instance, <laughs> well, Canada would always be, be Canada as the, the example, though, well, I actually think that the, the, the empirical policy research is very weak. I mean, I couldn't tell you how much support different European governments grant to immigrant organizations or immigrant cultural activities because no one um, has tried to put figures to that and maybe you couldn't because it's mixed up with other budgets. Yeah, so for Germany, some people have tried. For Britain, I think no one has an idea of what multiculturalism there actually means. So I generally say, well, I think it's mainly a general commitment to cultural plurality, a positive attitude to ethnic plurality in a society, and for that to continue and it's usually accompanied by a positive attitude to immigration as well. And I think I would say a yeah, multiculturalist should be of the opinion that this um, cultural plurality should also be supported by state policies. So if your idea is that the public life of a nation state is not to be uniform, then you have to give some funding, you have to acknowledge this plurality <laughs> by funding the organized expression of cultural differences. Otherwise, you claim that you are, well, um, you support pluralism, but you don't do it in fact because the majority culture would always be the hegemonic culture unless you give organized support to the minorities as well. So in some sense, but there is no clear policy program that is applied everywhere. So you would find mother tongue teaching done very strongly in Dutch schools, but for instance, not even in Canada, it's done systematically in public schools. I think it's done mainly by minority organizations. They get some money for it, but it's self-organized, so it's not part of the institutional system. As far as I know, it's not in Britain, not part of the school system. They always say, well, all these different languages they speak in India and Pakistan, you wouldn't know which one to teach of those, which is true to some extent, but maybe a simple way out of the problem. It did exist and still does exist in Germany, which is not regarded as a multicultural country as part of a return policy, as Germany for a long time thought, well, these immigrant children should at some point go home, so they have to know their own language. But you could say, I can effect this kind of multicultural effect, although the intentions were, were different. So they have a very complicated mix. Now, what do people think they support when they say multiculturalism makes Britain a better Place. I'm not sure because in, in surveys, I mean, you 
always get a very confused picture of ordinary, peop ordinary people's political beliefs. I mean, here they ask people, where well, people who come to live in Britain should adopt British values, traditions. You should have thought, well, this is opposed to multiculturalism, but you find, well, the support is almost <laughs> the same. So the same people say, yes, I favor multiculturalism. They say, yes, I favor adjustment to British ways. So, well, there you are. Um, difficult to interpret and also um, the previous one I had in the Eurobarometer, this, this year is for all the European countries, but you probably can't see this properly. This, when you look at the two questions, the general multicultural statement, yeah, it's a good thing, fine, you get majority support, but then more specifically, here for Germany or for any other country, the diversity in terms of race, religion, or culture adds to its strengths. Again, you should have thought, that, well, isn't that the same? No, it's not to most people. Yes, yeah, so this is a very dodgy thing. Well, what to do with surveys? So, I mean, you should always treat them very cautiously. I mean, it could have taken only the second question and argued that multiculturalism does not have majority support in the population, and probably sh you should look at both and mainly um, see that the trends are the same. It's always, well, you have larger parts of the population supporting it in the UK and in the Netherlands than in Germany. And Germany is with Belgium and Greece are actually the worst in, in Europe uh, in many surveys um, on immigration. And Denmark, Denmark and France, you see Denmark, France, Netherlands, UK are on the left, they are up the greatest shares supporting um, yeah. Plurality, yeah, Sorry, it's too long. Know. Yeah, more I'm questions. Okay. I'm trying to see if we can get in a couple more questions. And on a practical suggestion, if the Center for Advanced Study graduate students can hold their questions for Karen's meeting with us at 3 o'clock this afternoon, <laughs> then maybe we can get in other people. But mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead, please. I'm curious about the current political discourse as far as granting uh, babies born to um, immigrants of uh, German nationality. I know that currently isn't happening anymore. Is this in political discussions now? Um, apparently, it does have benefits granting them voting rights, for example, and a greater integration into society. So I'm wondering, what is the status of that? Yeah. It's not for any um, child born of parents of non-German nationality. It depends on their residence status. Um, but since 2000, well, most immigrant children are granted German nationality um, when born in the country. And of course, they will hold voting rights when they turn 18 and opt for German nationality. At this point, there's a complicated option um, principle where they have dual nationality until they turn 18 and then they have to opt for one or the other nationality. And at the moment, there's a political debate about how to enforce that or whether... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, how do you do this? You would have to check upon everyone. You have to have a population register then for, for everyone born under these um, conditions and send them letters and demand a statement. Or how, how do you do it? Well, probably Germany is well organized and the state would probably be able to do that. But there are debates about, well, doesn't this alienate too many people? Is this wise? to do it, but you have to have contra controversy. I mean, there's some people say we should now drop this altogether and grant dual citizenship or whatsoever. And, but you also have conservatives who say we should go back to the old citizenship law and not grant um, automatic German nationality altogether. And while well, there, there have been restrictions to the new citizenship law as well, um, um, they, they have introduced the citizenship test, so people now have to take a course and then a test on, well, that's similar to other nations. You have, you have it in the US and you have it in, in Canada, and there's a debate about whether this is, in fact, selective. Um, I tend to think that social selection is more um, effective and taking place behind the scenes because you're not granted German nationality when you depend on social welfare. 
and when you're, for instance, illiterate, because then you can't meet the language requirements, etc. And this is not that much debated, but I think probably this is the really serious issue, that there are people who are excluded from German nationality, but they have permanent residence. So they're going to stay. No German government will be able to drive them out of the country, but they're not granted full political rights. So what's the idea behind that? You exclude people of lower social standing from political rights? I mean, normally this was the case before the First World War in the German Kaiserreich, but not since democracy has been introduced. So this is the serious issue, I think. Whether the law has changed public opinion. I was wondering if there has been any change. Um, I think I haven't seen any survey material where you could well, link link the two. I think among the the Turkish origin population, there is a clear trend towards more participation in German society, more political participation, but naturalization figures have gone down again recently. So the law has only briefly increased figures and um, the trend is down. So this is a mixed picture. I mean, you have more political participation, more members of parliament, etc and more minority organizations. This is naturalizations in Germany. It's the first year on the left is 2000, the first year with, with the new, new law, and you see that the trend is pointing downwards. But on the other hand, it seems that they're contradicting trends that alienate immigrants from identifying fully with the German nation. So maybe I'm contradicting myself, I was just before emphasizing the interaction and the, the loyalty bit, but the, I mean, the picture is always not that simple. Yeah. I mean, I guess just my experience would say that the trend also has to, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to figure out what the trend means, if you're trying yeah. to discern meaning from the trend, then you also have to look at the population that you're drawing your naturalization applicants from. And if you have, as it looks like you did in 2000, a large, a large pool that naturalizes, hmm. leaving, f and then you have a lower, a lower set population. So unless you keep very high immigrant trends, which my assumption is in the, two, in the 1990s and 2000s, Germany did not. Oh, in the 1990s, yes, there was the peak of immigration in the post-war period. Enormous immigration. So if you naturalize most of them and then, you're, and then your legal permanent resident policies are... are there's no one left, you mean? Yeah, this well, I'm not saying well there's no but one not, left, not with these figures. I mean, there's some people say yes, sure. I mean, there was a backlog and this is why the, the figure is right. high initially, people waiting for the better opportunities and now, well, is the potential is lower. But I mean, there's 1.7 million Turkish nationals in Germany. Most of them have been there for more than 10 years. So this is a large so pool. There is new immigration, and it is significant. But um, this doesn't fully, fully explain why the figures are going down. It's, it's still a tiny minority who apply for naturalization. Although, I mean, the Turks are not the made just the last sentence. I mean, th there's other surveys asking people whether they would ever uh, consider applying for nationality, and the figures are lowest for of groups like Italians or the French, or they say, well, never, why would I? So, I mean, the, the, the problematic population is the resident without political rights or without full political rights would be the European Union citizens, not not the Turks or, I mean, Afghans, Palestinians, they have high rates of citizenship acquisition. Why don't we take one more question? 
Yeah. Um, I was just wondering whether we can talk a little bit about um, EU level policies, if there are any, mm -hmm. on immigration and multi multiculturalism, and if you see any convergence, maybe not in policy, but in discourse, um, in member state level. Um, well, this is a huge, huge <laughs> question. <laughs> I think, um, well, I'll try a short answer. I think convergence on the discourse level is a major feature and w not only in the way um, the media politicians talk about immigration, but also in the problem perceptions. And this increases immensely, at, at least from the German perspective. I'm not quite sure one would have to do a proper study looking at whether this is the same everywhere. But in Germany, you have one something happening in the Netherlands, the Van Gogh murder, or riots in Britain and in, in Paris. This quickly gets picked up almost immediately. And the finding that multiculturalism has failed, that there are separate communities, etc., PP, is immediately transferred to other countries. And I think this definitely happens between the Netherlands and Germany, to some extent France as a dense exchange, and also Britain. I would still claim that the background to this may still be different, but there is a perception that the problems are the same and they are defined in similar ways. So that definitely happens. I don't necessarily believe that this has much to do with the European Union. I mean, this is a separate question. Um, European Union involvement in immigration and integration policy has increased in the past few years, although there is still um, a significant resistance among member states. Britain, for instance, doesn't like EU intervention into border control issues. Germany at the moment tries to prevent any more European Union uh, involvement. So this is a controversial issue and it, it's still an area where the EU has much less to say than in other policy fields. But there are major initiatives. Well, the, the best known is anti-discrimination legislation, which has been enforced by the European Union. This would be the, the prime example of successful intervention and coordination of asylum seekers. This is where states easily agree that they make joint efforts to keep refugees out of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you.